everybody. So I am Eamon Maguire, and I like to talk about science that's in the everyday. Things we can all relate to. Specifically, I like to talk about sexy science. And I know what you're all thinking. Sexy, science, do those two words really go together? Well, hopefully by the end of this talk, I can convince you that they do. Vincent van Gogh once said, love is a mystery in a mystery. And I found this intriguing. Is love really so elusive? I was determined to find out. So I began by asking people what love meant to them. My sister said, love is completeness. My closest friend said, love is a socially acceptable form of insanity, but a beautiful madness. I asked my dad what love meant to him and he said, Emer, I have no idea. <laughs> but after a pretty one-sided discussion with my mother, he withdrew his answer. <laughs> and she said it was because they both thought love was indescribable. I made the mistake of asking my youngest brother what love meant to him, to which he shouted at me, why would you ask me that? You know I'm single. <laughs> so I widened my search. An elderly man at a bus stop told me love is jumping out of an airplane without a parachute. And a five-year-old that I babysit told me love is when mummy doesn't shout at daddy when he doesn't flush the toilet. And in 2012, the most Googled question of the year was, what is love? So obviously, I'm not the only person to have ever wondered this. But as I was listening to everyone's explanations, I couldn't help thinking that there was something missing. Yes, what they were saying was very romantic. It was so poetic. But I wanted facts and logic. I wanted science. And through my exploration, I have discovered that science splits love into three distinct stages. So join me on my journey of madness. We begin at stage one, lust. At puberty, two sex hormones become active in the body, estrogen and testosterone. And from then on in, we are constantly on the prowl you obviously all know what I'm talking about, for someone to reproduce with. But how do we entice them? We flirt. Some of us better than others. <laughs> but we really underestimate how important flirting is because flirting gives us a risk-free way of previewing a potential partner without giving them access to our precious genes. And every minute that we are flirting, our brain is subconsciously calculating our compatibility with that person. So leave your wingman at home because the brain is the ultimate matchmaker. And make your first line a good one because it takes the brain less than one second to decide if you are going to fancy someone or not. And a bit of a glimmer of hope for the less attractive amongst us. Good flirting technique is more important than good looks, according to science. <laughs> Someone said yay, that was really sad. <laughs> <laughs> now, interestingly enough, flirting is only 7% words because our true feelings seep out through our body language. Women are subtle. A hair flick here, a coy laugh there. <laughs> All to appear more feminine and youthful, signs of estrogen, and fertility. Men, on the other hand, are as subtle as a brick. They engage in these large <laughs> testosterone fueled movements, all to show they can protect and provide for any future family. Now, both genders use nature's greatest flirting technique, the copulatory gaze. This intimate eye contact ignites an animalistic part of the human brain, 
giving us two choices, approach or retreat. Now, animals aren't as tactful as us humans with their unrequited lust. For example, if a flirty male spider approaches an unwilling female, she doesn't just say, no, thank you, and retreat. She eats him. <laughs> so don't feel too bad next time someone swipes left on Tinder or rejects you on a night out, because seriously, it could be worse. Now, let's say that I've used all my best moves, and you were all desperate enough to fall for them. Come with me to stage two, romantic attraction. People associate love with the heart, but the real magic happens in the brain. And using an MRI scanner, scientists were able to see the parts of the brain that light up when people are madly in love. The first area is the caudate nucleus, and it helps us expect and detect rewards. In this case, love. The second is the ventral tegmental area. It is a chemical making factory. Our own personal cupid shooting arrows laced with love drugs into our vulnerable brains. These love drugs are serotonin blockers, adrenaline and dopamine. And this chemical cocktail gives us a natural high, stimulating the same area of the brain as cocaine with similar side effects, like loss of sleep and appetite, increased heart rate, obsessive thoughts, and ultimately, addiction. Put simply, we are chemically insane. Now, we humans aren't the only ones who experience this type of love sickness. Animals feel it too. So if we look at the male seal, in the time period that the male seal is trying to woo, woo the female seal, he becomes so exhausted with the amount of effort that he's putting in that he loses over half his entire body weight. Likewise, during elephant mating season, again, the male elephant, when he is trying to woo the female elephant and then goes on to have elephant uh, relations, he becomes so thin, exhausted and frail that he has to go back to his herd and rest for months to rebuild his strength. <laughs> I love the way Mother Nature planned it, so it's only the males who have to put up with these kind of things. And this is the stage at which us humans are obsessive because our new love is all we can think about, all we can talk about, much to the annoyance of everybody else around us. Some of us even resort to stalking on Facebook, on Twitter, and on Instagram. But we can't help it because everything is so new and so exciting. And we just know that no two people in the world have ever been as in love as we two. But the brain simply cannot survive in this obsessive, amped up, possessive, blissful, drugged up state forever. So it sobers up, guiding us to stage three, attachment. You are now in this for the long haul. The brain responds with a rush of oxytocin, the love hormone. It is the glue in a long-term relationship, keeping us together long enough to raise a family. This is happily ever after. This is the point at which you drive off into the sunset in your lovely family Volvo with your 2.4 beautiful children. Sounds great. But things don't always go to plan. We have divorce, we have cheating, we have commitment phobes. So what is the flaw in Mother Nature's perfect three-step plan? We are. Humans have flaws. And some of us get addicted to the cocaine-like high of stage two that we simply can't move on to stage three because where will we get our next hit? Some of us become stage three junkies and we bypass stage one and stage two altogether because we're not driven by lust and addiction, but by stability and family life. So I suspect everybody here in some way will become affected 
by this drug called love. So next time you find yourself doing something crazy, like having names for all the children that you are definitely going to have with your boyfriend of two weeks, or like planning your entire life around uh, casually bumping into your crush, don't blame yourself, blame science. Thank you. <laughs>